Hi, I'm Stella O'Malley, a psychotherapist in Ireland. And I'm Sasha Ayad, an adolescent therapist in the United States. Through in-depth interviews, personal stories, and psychological exploration, we probe the gender landscape within contemporary culture. And we consider the implications of prioritizing personal identity over other aspects of the self. This is the thinking person's take on gender. Join us as we look at gender from a wider lens. You're very welcome to this special edition of uh, Gender, A Wider Lens. And uh, we are delighted, delighted to welcome Chloe Cole to our podcast. So Chloe, we have been so looking forward to talking to you for some time, and I think the fact that it lined up with this event is just really lovely. So as I was saying to you a moment ago, it's just going to be a normal, intimate conversation where you tell us about a lot of personal details in front of a ton of people and a live streaming audience. Normal stuff. Pretty standard stuff. Yeah, pretty standard. Um, I mean, I imagine many people here do know about your story, but we'd like to actually go through it again and understand where you were emotionally and psychologically throughout your childhood, as your dysphoria developed, and then also about the kind of care that you received. So can you just kind of tell us your story? Like, how did all of this emerge for you? As a kid, I mean, especially as I got older, I did have quite a bit of a tomboyish streak, especially in terms of my sense of humor and some of my personal interests, um, some of the stuff that I like illustrating, for example. And I felt like I just really connected a lot more to some of the boys my age and the girls, and especially with my my big brothers, some of my boy cousins, and my dad over like my my sisters and my mother, and I mean the middle members of my family, I really looked up to them. I I can I like to dress like them. I hope that I could be half as funny as my older brothers and maybe as strong one day. I mean I really love them. I want to ask about that because yeah. a sense of humor comes up a lot when I'm talking to young females with gender dysphoria. Can you just elaborate a little bit more about what you just said about like wanting to be funny, wanting to have a sense of humor? One of the, one of the messages I got growing up about women, which many of the ones that I, that I got during that point in time, especially in my adolescent years, was that women were less smart, not nearly as strong, and often like not as funny. It was like it's like a common joke that women just when they when they try to tell jokes out it just falls flat. Um, and I personally found like a lot of like the male fam- members of my family and my peers to have a better sense of humor. I personally have always kind of had like a kind of like an out there sense of humor, a little crass at times. Um, and a lot of girls growing up just did not really like that at all. <laughs> Uh, and could I ask, like, let's say when you were four and five and six, were you considered the the kind of conventional little girl or were you a tomboyish girl? Or, you know what I mean? Yeah, like in those earlier years, I was definitely a lot girlier. Um, my dad once told me that I couldn't even leave the house without a tutu or like oh, yeah. bright blues or pinks on because that's just what I liked. And then as I got older, it was just like kind of sick of it. And it probably makes people think I'm like dumb or trivial or something so I kind of I started rejecting it after a while in favor for like shorts and flannels and stuff like that more plain clothes and shorter hair just because like it was easier to to keep up with and was that like pleasant as in you were just doing your style and it was flannels and shorts or were you starting to go into a I I don't like being a girl um it was definitely a little bit of both um it was it was kind of natural But it was also a little bit exaggerated, I think, too, just because, like, I didn't want to be seen as one of the other girls, and I didn't want, like, all the, all the baggage that came, came with that, and I didn't want to, one of the things that really sucked about going to puberty, which I started puberty pretty young, I was about eight or nine, when my breasts started to develop, was that, like, I knew that these friend, these close friendships with the boys my age, the dynamics of that would change, and now they, that wouldn't really be a possibility anymore. I think and I it, wanted to keep that. I think early puberty is, is really hard on, on girls. Eight or nine is very young, especially because the boys that age are 
are really childish. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was one thing about it. Like, a lot of people, including like some of my peers, would make comments on my body, like my, like my body hair, or like the development of my chest, for example. It was real. It was really uncomfortable for me, and it felt like that's where a lot of the attention on me would be focused on, just like these parts of me that I didn't really want anybody to really see. So you kind of described that you wanted to be a part of like the boy world of fun and jokes and like lighthearted humor, and yet your body developing thrust you into this very different type of interactions with males and boys. And I'm wondering when you started to dress in a more masculine way, what happened next? Did it did it stave off that kind of sexual attention? Did it work? Um, I mean, I feel like it kind of did. Um, it definitely did, actually. Most of the... I wouldn't really say the boys were really interested in me anyways, because... Because I was kind of a weird kid, not you exactly. Making, you were making <laughs> fart jokes and the things other boys did. Okay. Okay, so you didn't get actually that kind of attention. Did yes, you, you feel conflicted about that? Were you like, oh, phew, but also why doesn't anyone notice me that way? Yeah, it was, it was a little bit of both. Like, especially as I started going through puberty more and more, it was like, it felt like the growth of the other girls around me were, was just like outpacing mine. Like they were starting to grow taller than me. Like I had like a big thing about being taller than my peers for a little bit. Cause like I was like four foot 11, five feet at nine years old. And I was one of the tallest in my class. And then all of a sudden, like two years later, everybody's growing past me again. Um, that was one thing I was, I was really proud about when it came to like my, my appearance. Um, but then like I started to think about like, well, my, I should have like big boobs. Like I should have a small waist. I should have like big hips and big thighs. Cause I grew up in the age of, curvy women, thick, bottom heavy, hourglass, pear. And I didn't look like that, you know? Like I was a skinny kid and I had like a little bit of mu muscle packed on my body. I had bigger shoulders than a lot of the girls my age. And I felt like it made me look like a, more like a boy my age than anything. And that was one thing that I was pretty insecure about. You were actually feeling uncomfortable that you looked like a boy. Yeah, it was, it's probably kind of confusing because all these feelings were so, they sound I so know. conflicting, yeah. Yeah. but like it's it just, it was really hard dealing with all these expectations of how I was supposed to look and also like the consequences of, of all of it. No, I think you're, you're hitting the nail on the head. That's exactly the confusion of puberty. It's, I, I don't want to look like a girl. I don't want to look like a boy. Ah, I, don't, I don't want to be looked at fundamentally. Especially when you're young and your body is outgrowing your mind. Yeah. It's a scary feeling. Very. Um, I don't know if you're comfortable sharing these levels of details, but at that point, was your family picking up on the fact that you had this really uncomfortable feeling, you had this conflicted feeling with like your relationships to others? Can you say a little more about that? Not really. I mean, like my mom and dad knew that I was, you know, I was previously diagnosed with ADHD. Um, while we were trying to get me screened for autism when I was younger, and that that was affecting like my my schoolwork and potentially like some of my friendships as well, I had always been eccentric and a bit different from the other kids around my age, so it was going to be difficult for me to to make friends anyways. And I mean, they were just going along with the puberty. I wasn't. I don't. I don't feel like I was really given much guidance around it in general. And were you in in deep distress or was it just, it was an uncomfortable, you were being sexualized before your body was ready. Do you, do you know what I mean? Because we're about to take a big swerve here and it, it doesn't quite sound like that at this point. It feels really uncomfortable. I mean, there were times when I felt like I didn't, I wasn't going to have any worth as a woman because I was not feminine enough. And I also didn't necessarily want to be feminine because I didn't want to, I didn't want to face the repercussions of that. And I felt like I even looked like a boy in that if I were just born as, a, as the opposite sex, that I would be happier. But I didn't really have the idea in my mind that I actually was of the opposite sex until much later when I was about 12 or 13 years old. So bridge the gap for us there. Yeah. That was about the time when I started using my first cell phone. Um, 
right before my 12th birthday, I was given my very first iPhone. And you know, like all, almost all the other kids my age already had one. I mean, as, er as early as like second grade, some of them. And they were all using social media. They were all using apps like Snapchat, Kick, Instagram. So I was gonna go to all of those and see what I was missing out on. And I did. And a lot of the posts I was seeing were um, based around mostly like my, my own interests, things like art, comics, manga, anime, um, video games, things of that sort. Seemingly very innocent, mm -hmm. but there was one thing I noticed about those communities and it was that a lot of them were filled with people who identified as a part of the LGBT. Um, people who called themselves gay or lesbian or bisexual, and a lot of them had a different gender identity than their sex. Like many of them were non-binary, um, many of them were young women identifying as trans boys and men. And this is something that I didn't really grow up thinking about much. Um, like sometimes like I would have feelings for, for other girls my age the same way that I would have a crush on a, on a boy, or like for, for a celebrity, for example. Um, but I never really thought about what my gender meant, what that would mean for, for who I was as a person. So it really made me start to think like, huh, this is very, this is very new to me. I wonder, because I also felt like I really, I, I felt very attached to this community at the time because it was very, it was just so unique with all these different people in it who had interest quite like mine. Um, many of them had struggled with things like bullying growing up, quite like I did. But they had this, they, they made this little community for themselves where they were, they were all accepting and loving of each other. And that was something that I had always wanted. I want to just make sure that the picture in my mind that's emerging is accurate. These communities you said are based on a lot of your common interests, like your, your interest in art, your creativity, manga, yeah. anime. So are these people with like profile pictures of like characters? And yeah, sometimes they'll have like a... Their manga shows and things like that. Yeah, sometimes they'll have like, a, like an anime character, like a video game character with like some flag behind it in, yeah. in their profile picture. And like all these colorful flags and new new phrases with which you can describe yourself. It's just, especially for a kid, mm -hmm. that's, that's very interesting. Like that's, that draws a lot of attention. So I, I can, I'm kind of seeing you now and you're kind of seeing this new world and you're like, I, these are my people. And the, on some level you felt connected. With oh yeah. Them. And were you as such disconnected from your own friends in school, or, or was it just that they were so compelling online? Yeah, I was definitely a little bit dissociated from the world around me. Um, I'm the youngest of five kids, um, and all my siblings are significantly older than me. So pretty much everybody moved out by the time that I was like in like late elementary school. And that was pretty lonely. Um, even while they were in the house, it was like they were all teenagers for a lot of my childhood, so they wanted to go off and, and do their own thing. I didn't always have somebody to, to hang around. I didn't really hang out with people from school either. And I think after like all my siblings left and became more independent, that was when like I really started to turn to the internet. Even before I got my phone, like I was like using the family computer and stuff. And was there a moment that you kind of thought, yeah, this is me, this yeah, was there a moment it looks like there was? Yeah, it, it was very gradual. It started with the questioning of my sexuality, because again, sometimes like I, I didn't really feel at the time that I had like a particular preference towards men or women. And then I started thinking about my gender, because, I mean, I thought, well, what does it mean to feel like a girl or a boy? You know, I don't necessarily feel like I connect a lot with the, with the girls my age, with the girls in my family even. Maybe something's up. And so I kind of like experimented with the different labels until I finally landed on, this is it. I'm just a boy. That's how things were supposed to be. Can I ask, do you, do you have an estimate of how many hours a day were you online? Because I know you were not really connected with that many people at school. You were, your siblings were gone. You were a bit alone at home. How many hours a day were you online? 
Too many. <laughs> Probably like whenever I got home to the end of the day. Yeah. Whenever I was done with homework. So what about the buildup to announcing that you were having these questions to your parents or to any other adults? Because I know from working with young people and talking to parents, this is a big deal. So can you talk to us a bit about like, how did you decide to say something yeah. to anyone? Yeah, it started with telling some of my friends at school and online. Those people online weren't necessarily, weren't necessarily parts of the, the transgender community. I wasn't really interacting with that community really until after I started hormones. Um, and I actually got a mostly negative response from a lot of my friends at school. Um, they pushed back on it quite a bit, but it was in a pretty mean-spirited way. It was basically just like an opportunity for them to make fun of me again for being different. And that sort of pushed me further into it, I felt like, because it was like, wow, these people are being jerks for no reason. Like, I felt like I felt pressured to, to prove them wrong. Uh, I, I'd say that's really key that you kind of felt you'd found your, your community in a way, declared it, and then the, the real life people went, nah, and you'd go deeper. Yes. Deeper in, yeah. And then, yeah, I came out to one of my older sisters afterward, and she was pretty supportive. And the next move was my mom and dad, because I felt like they deserved to know that, you know, like they're, they're my parents. That's a pretty big thing for me that they should probably know about. I wasn't really sure about how to go about it though, just cause it was very, it was a very intimidating subject. I wasn't exactly sure about, uh, about how they would respond. Cause like sometimes I would hear them talking about like a transgender celebrity or something and be like, well, he still looks like a man. And I, I didn't know if they would like have the same response to me. Like I, I, I knew they loved me, but stuff like that just kind of, and also like the stories within the community of like being kicked out or like being abused by their parents or like being gay or transgender kind of made me feel a little bit more tense about it. So I decided to like, I decided to write a letter to them because it kind of like gave us some, some space and some time to think about it. And upon reading it, they were very, they were pretty supportive, like superficially at least. What age were you at this point? I was, this is right before my 12th birthday, like maybe a month or so before. And, like, they, they were okay with me, like, experimenting with the way that I presented myself and dressed and things like that. And they tried to, like, go along with my preferred pronouns and name and calling me their son and stuff. But, of course, they didn't want me to, they didn't want me to do any of the permanent interventions because they were sensible. They were pretty smart about it, I think. Um, and there weren't really as many resources back then as there are now. Seven years ago now. Nearly About 2017. Um, but they were kind of, my dad kind of saw right away that this could have been connected to my mental health issues at the time, especially like with my, what they then thought was ADHD, um, my struggles with socializing and fitting in, especially like as a tomboyish and, a, and more artistic girl. Um, and they, they, they also, they were, they were just not really sure about how to really go about it. So... They started like they they went to the internet to do their own research, and it was suggested that Kaiser was one of the best healthcare providers in our state. We're from California, and caring for gender dysphoric adolescents and youth, and to them, care just meant like oh, like they're gonna give her therapy and they're gonna help her through these feelings until she's an adult and capable of making perhaps like a more permanent decision on her own. But that was quite the opposite of what happened. And can you walk us through that? <laughs> We're really pushing you here. <laughs> but could you walk us through like the first appointment? Who was there? How did it go? Um, it's hard to remember the exact details because it was so far back. But all I really remember with that first therapist was just affirmation upon affirmation. Like there was no real questioning of it. Like he, he was pretty lousy actually. Like he, <laughs> he would like refer to me by my preferred name and identity and such, but he wasn't addressing like the real issues in my life. Like I had like my phone taken away for a few months. Um, I was having struggles again at school, especially with like people making fun of me just for trying to present myself as a boy. Um, 
And a lot of my friends were older than me, so they had graduated that school by that point. And it was a pretty lonely time for me. And that was, when I would talk about this, the, the psychologist would just say, huh, yeah, that's, that's, that's weird that that's happening. I'm sorry about that. And then he wouldn't like, he wouldn't like teach me what to, how to, how to deal with this in the meanwhile. It was just, most of the focus was just on my, my gender. And I became, I actually became more distressed over time because it was like nothing was happening at all. Can I ask, um, you know, you got, you got to see a therapist who presumably it's their job to help you sort this out. Do you think that you were wanting or hoping for something specific from your parents that um, you didn't get or? I mean, I don't know. What I was really seeking at the time was like going through like an actual medical transition because I thought that was like the only, the only path I had. I truly believed that I was actually somehow a boy. I, I really believed in like the, the brain sex theory, like the idea that people are transgender because there's some like genetic marker or like a, like a marker in their brain chemistry that makes them somehow the opposite sex. And I didn't really, I wasn't really ever told any differently. Did anybody go through with you the, the kind of the biology of a girl and the biology of a boy and what happens in any of that? I mean, during the, the consultations for like the hormones and stuff, yeah, we went over some of the side effects. It was in very vague terms. And I mean, when you're describing all of this to a child, it's, it just goes straight through the head. Because kids, especially teenagers, are, they're pretty ballsy. They, they're not necessarily known for making the most responsible decisions for themselves. And when you're perfectly healthy, you just think, well, I mean, how am I supposed to know which of these I'm going to experience? Because, like, I've never really been unhealthy before. Um, but, no, like, I, I was 13 at the time. I was in eighth grade. And I hadn't gone through, like, the full course of sex ed yet. So I didn't really know, like, I couldn't like list off like all the, like all the parts of my reproductive system or like the four stages of the menstrual cycle. All I knew is that like there was a period and I didn't like it yeah. and I wanted it to be gone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I feel just very strongly compelled to say something and then we'll get back to the time. An adult, at least one, should have stepped in to help you and explain to you that it's okay to feel that discomfort and that you don't need to do anything to your body. And I, I just, I don't know the situation of all the people in your life, but I, I just feel really compelled to say that because I'm sure lots of people here are thinking about that. Yeah, my mom and dad, they actually pushed back a little bit when it came to the medicalization. They were worried as to why I wanted it so badly. They didn't really understand why. And the only, the only doctor who really pushed back was the first endocrinologist who I was referred to after I was diagnosed with gender dysphoria. And he only said no because apparently I wasn't socially transitioned enough. I'm not exactly sure what that was supposed to mean. Like maybe my hair wasn't cut short enough or, or maybe I wasn't wearing the right clothes or something. I think he gave me like roughly like a year or so to come back, but 14 just isn't, that's not a big difference. And I'm sure if some professional had provided the context to you and your family to understand this, your family would have had a very strong reaction. Absolutely. I mean, my mom and dad were actually not involved in these, in at least the therapy appointments at all. So they didn't know what was actually being discussed. They didn't really know what my emotional state was really like because the doctors would just not follow up with them. So they didn't know what was going on. And... I mean, they were, they were lied to. They were told that I was going to be suicidal and potentially dead if I wasn't given whatever I wanted, basically. And did they believe that you were somehow a, a, a boy in a girl's body or something? Um, I didn't necessarily think that they thought that. But, I mean, the suicide thing really reel them in like they when you're told by a doctor that the only two options for your child are suicide 
or medical intervention, you'll choose a second. What wouldn't you do for them? We hope you're enjoying this conversation as much as we are. We just wanted to take a quick moment and say thank you to all of our listeners. Your support is the fuel that keeps this train running. So please be sure to like and subscribe on YouTube or your favorite podcast platforms. And do be sure to check out the conversations that are happening on YouTube in the comments section. We think that we have some of the smartest, most engaged viewers out there, and we really appreciate all of the interactions. Also, we produce additional bonus content every week for our listener community on Patreon. Go to widerlenspod.com and click on join our listener community. Your financial support means a lot to us. And for those of you who are in need of parenting support and resources, we each have parent coaching membership groups. So please do check those out. You can find links to both of them at widerlenspod.com or in the show notes. And of course, you can buy our book When Kids Say They're Trans out now in the UK and coming out very soon in the US. Thank you so much. Now back to the show. So what was the next step? So you start seeing this therapist behind closed doors. You are, your family's given this narrative of the transition or die narrative. What happens next? Um, I'd say like roughly less than six months actually between like first seeing the therapist, um, had passed by and then actually like being administered the puberty blockers. So I was about 13 and a half, halfway through my eighth grade year. And then my body was just completely devoid of sex hormones. Can I ask before we go to the puberty blockers, were you really intent on give me the puberty blockers were you leading the way or were you almost haplessly saying what what happens next doctor um i would say i was i was definitely intent on getting these treatments but that was because i wasn't really given another option yeah like it was it was very it was very led by me as the the naive child patient yeah 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 you were 13 I mean, nobody had to really told me any differently. Like, you don't have to do this. Like, it's probably, it's very likely not going to work out. It's more dangerous the younger you go, and now is not the time. Wow. So then you started the puberty blockers. Yes. And, I mean, it was just an awful experience. I was on them for maybe about a year, and for about, like, a month or two out of that time was when I was on them alone, right? And, you know, I was already about four years into puberty by this point in time. So now all of a sudden my body has like no sex hormones in it at all, which basically caused an artificial menopause. So at 13 years old, I was experiencing things that women really only start to experience when they're in their early 50s. Things like hot flashes, which was like this uncomfortable, like hot sensation all over my body. And this was accompanied by like, tingling sensations, itching, sometimes even like burning sensations like in in my limbs and my fingers. And it was very uncomfortable. I was also like very lethargic during this time because of course like I'm not having a cycle, there's no hormones in my body. So I was like, I very much preferred being on the hormones. That was, I was basically waking up every day hoping that the next, or that that day I would start the hormones. Because the puberty blockers made you feel so bad, you thought, get me to the next stage as fast as I can. Yeah, and I was only on it. I was only on them alone for, again, like a month or two. I can't imagine how it would have been like if I was on them for a full year or for several years. They have kids on them starting at like 11 or 12 and up until they turn 18. I could never have done that. Okay, so, so you, you started though after puberty had been going on for some time. So basically they extracted the natural sex hormones from your body using these puberty blockers and you were drained of energy and libido and like life energy. Yeah. And so then you were like, okay, moving on to the next stage in a few months. Yep. Okay, so then you started cross sex hormones. Yeah, um, I mean, that was pretty exhilarating. It was, there is that element of the, the gender euphoria because like, wow, it's like this big step in my life towards becoming my greater self as a boy. I'm gonna start seeing all these physical changes. I'm gonna actually be perceived as the boy who I truly am by the people around me. And the cognitive effects were pretty much there immediately. 
Um, I had like a sharp boost in my confidence. Um, I don't know if it was just like artificially or if it was like directly because of the hormones, probably a little bit of both. Um, and then a very steep increase in my libido, which proved pretty troublesome throughout my teen years. Um, you know, like most men yeah. learn how to control it because puberty starts up for them and the increase in androgens is very gradual. And also you have like male figures in your life to help guide you through this. But I didn't really have any of, any of that. Like this was, a, this was a sudden boost in my sex drive that was incredibly uncomfortable to deal with. Um, and I'm also on the spectrum. So I was constantly aroused and it ba sex basically became like a hyper fixation for me. And it was very dangerous for me because I was very prone to, it made me very, so, so that I was very prone to being groomed by, by older men who were preying on my loneliness as well as this. Sex drive. Yes. Um, and you were, you were online throughout a lot yes, of this. So yes, yes. The, the canvas of your life that you were actually acting out these new experiences emotionally, psychologically was online? Or a lot of it. Or were you like connecting with friends in real life and saying, hey, I, let's hook up? Like what? It was, it was all online, luckily. Nothing ever physically happened in person, but there were a few times when it got very close. It was, it was, it was very precarious. What do you mean that you nearly met them in real life or something? Oh, was that? I, I don't understand what you mean by precarious. It was, very, it was very dangerous because some of these people like, were planning to actually meet up with me. Wow. And these are like grown adults, like mid-20s. Throughout this experience, I mean, this is a known uh, side effect of testosterone. Were you given any counseling, guidance, therapy, a process through the clinic that was providing these medical interventions about, like, what happens when you have an increase in, like, did, were you guided no. through this at all? No, not at all. And did, did anybody know that you were going through this? No, and it would have been embarrassing for me to talk yeah. about anyways because I was young. Like, I don't want to be talking young. to adults about sex. No, that is so hard. What happened next? Keep going. Then the physical changes started to come in. The first being, I think like the, the, the deepening of my voice, which was like less than a month afterward, actually. It was really quick. And I guess I had my dad's voice genes because I had a very deep voice for a little while, like much deeper than a lot of my male peers, even a lot of my male teachers. Um, so much deeper than it is now. Um, and then the changes to my appearance um, included like the thickening of the hair all over my body, like including like my, my eyelashes, my eyebrows, uh, my facial hair, even like the hair on my head. And of course, like the, the hair on my limbs and other parts of my body. Um, and then came the fat redistribution from like my hips and my thighs, and my breasts more towards my midsection and the muscle was probably the most exciting part about it. Cause it's like, wow, like I, like there's this healthy glow on my skin and now like I can like easily build muscle and look fit without really do, doing much. And as a girl who struggled a lot with, with body image issues, it felt great to finally have control over the way that I looked. I often think that's a, a very big deal for gir FTMs, girls to, to boys. They see the muscle and they feel powerful and they're really into the muscle. It, it, it's kind of a major deal for them. Did you, did you have that experience? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Was that something you had been organically interested in or was that part of the expectation that in order to be a real trans guy, you got to get buff? I think it was definitely more towards the latter. So these changes happen, and in some ways you're euphoric, which yeah. is a word we hear about a lot. At what point did that take a different direction? Um, I mean, once I was like a year or two into high school, like maybe like a year after I was put on the, the hormones and the other interventions was when things really started to, to take a turn. Um, before I went into high school, I everybody around me, I had known pretty much since elementary school. So it was like, everybody knows I'm a girl. Like I'm not fooling anybody, no matter how masculine I look. So I decided like, I'm just gonna wait it out to high school and then I'll change my name in the, the school files and I'll come out to anybody if I still need to by that point in time. 
And I also wasn't really making any effort to hide my breasts because of that. And so one day I'd actually been sexually assaulted by one of my peers in the classroom. Um, I never really thought about binding before that, but now like this part of my body that I already was very insecure about, was very conscious about, was now, it felt even more exposed. I felt compromised. But with this happening in a crowded classroom where nobody seemed to even notice or care, and with the mindset that I was already in of like, well, I'm a guy, like I'm supposed to tough it out. I didn't really even have a chance at um, recovering from the situation. Um, especially because the school that I was at, like I, I had certain needs with my education. I had like a 504 IEP plan in place that my, my teachers were supposed to abide by. They didn't care about it. They didn't care about these, about the rules in it. If they didn't care about my education, how could I expect them to help me feel safe after one of their students assaulted me on their campus? There was just no way. So I never really reported it. It took a really long time for me to even register it as like a sexual assault. And it was kind of repressed in the back of my mind for a little bit. But that fear of somebody even recognizing the fact that I was female and of being sexually taken advantage of, again, was there for years. Yeah, I just wanna say, like, just spend a second here. What a complete, can I swear here? What a complete mind fuck that you are, you're telling yourself, I am a male. My breast gets touched, uh, violating me. How can I actually admit that I was sexually assaulted on my breast when I think I'm a guy and I want others to think I'm a guy, and I'm already on testosterone. So like, I can't even begin to imagine how just confusing and isolating that was. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't really think words could describe just how much it was. Yeah. I, didn't, I didn't tell anybody about it for years. And that was when I, I, start, I decided I'm gonna buy a binder. Nobody's gonna, gonna ever see this part of me ever again. And I did. And summer came, um, high school was about to start up. I got my, my name changed in the school files and by this point in time, I was binding. My chest seemed to be completely flat and now I had a deep voice so almost nobody could even guess that I was actually a girl anymore. Ready and that felt great. Behind, yeah. Yes, it was, it was a new life for myself. Yeah. I could finally escape the pain of being a woman. Mm -hmm. This is the big thing. You're at the end of the rainbow. You've done everything. You've changed the name. You've, you've, you've got there. And I think this is almost the, the hardest moment. Yeah, um, right before that came the bliss, the excitement of everybody knowing me as a boy and people from like elementary and middle school some of them not recognizing me, others like go, going along with it because I certainly tricked the eye. I mean, how couldn't they? Um, and the dynamics of my relationship started to change. I started developing more friendships with, with boys and it just, it felt great. It was, it was pretty exciting stuff. It was very fun. Um, excuse me. <laughs> just to be in that dynamic again, like when I was a kid and Right. Sort of, like, yeah. Like an innocence that can come back, like the fun, lighthearted play with the boys. Is yes. Back. Yeah. yeah, and now like it, there was like kind of a boost in my confidence too because there were there were like girls starting to develop crushes on me. Like sometimes like uh, I mean nobody like ever really confessed to my face, but sometimes like my friends would come back to me. They'd be like, "These girls are saying some saying some crazy stuff about you," or like. It actually got kind of creepy. Um, there were a few times when girls would like follow me around or they'd like take pictures of me or like try to like get me to kiss them. And part of the re part of what motivated me to go further in the transition, especially after that incident, was to avoid being sexually assaulted. But I actually got assaulted and harassed more often while I was perceived as a boy than I ever was as a girl. Like people people thought that because I was a guy they could do, or because I they thought I was a guy that they could do anything with me and just get away with it. Girls did. Yeah, and sometimes even guys. Okay. 
Well, okay, so at this at this point, <laughs> you're you're having this like totally shocking experience. Like you you've fooled everybody, and it's starting to go a little bit haywire. And it's going haywire. <laughs> so then what? Um, it was exciting for some time. And then it started to get frustrating with all the weird stuff starting to happen. And then like going back to baseline and then realizing, hey, like I can't really be as intimate with people anymore. Like I can't really like hug my girlfriends anymore without somebody asking like, oh, like are you guys in a relationship? Or like, oh, like you're not supposed to like touch her that way. Or like, oh, she has a boyfriend or something, even though like I didn't really have any interest in the girls around me for the most part. Um, and now like I, there were things that I couldn't. You were being treated a little bit like a predator or something? Um, not quite, but like I saw, one thing that I, started to f that I started to fear as like some of my friends, like I had some friends who were like falsely accused of some crazy stuff and like it ruined like their, their lives at school. Like something like got cooked off the, the football team or they had to move schools. And eventually there, that, that fear came in where it was like, wait, like I look like one of them. What if this happens to me? Yeah. And also like, I just, I started to become more and more stressed over time for various reasons. And I, did, I also didn't really have as much room anymore to talk about this with anybody around me because I was expected to be tough. I was expected to just be a man. It feels like there was just a lot of sex kind of in the, in the atmosphere, really. Yeah, it was... As opposed to, I don't know, sports and best friends and films and all the other things that make up teenage life. Yeah, it became very... I think part of it is just like I grew up in a very over sexualized generation. Like it it's almost too. like an expectation that you're supposed to be having sex all the time. Yeah. Pretty much like as soon as you start puberty. So you start being overwhelmed. Did any of that overwhelm cause you to start questioning the transition itself? Or when did you start to question that piece? No, I it took a long while for me to get to the point of questioning my transition. That happened well after my surgery, actually. Um I started to become more depressed over time. Um, eventually in my sophomore year, um, I was like using substances because of peer influence. Like all my friends were like using, using like marijuana and nicotine and, and smoking and stuff. And I got caught up in, in that. I mean, before I transitioned, I was actually like a pretty, I guess you could say straight edge or just normal kid. Like I had no interest in any of those, thing, of the, any of those things, but as I started the androgens, like I became more ballsy, like more interested in like breaking boundaries and trying new things. And of course, because I was a kid using this stuff, like it was going to make me worse. And that combined with like the, the loneliness of transitioning, um, of basically like wearing a facade every day and also of just like being perceived as a boy was really starting to catch up to me. And it was, it was actually showing like in my, my grades, my performance at school was starting to, to suffer. And so I was diagnosed with major depressive disorder and I was medicated for it. Um, I didn't really respond very well to it. Nobody really ever questioned like, well, maybe the medication is doing this to you. Like, so, like in, in my appointments, like they would ask me, um, how's your gender dysphoria doing? And it was like, I, you, you know, like I, 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 I pass as the opposite sex pretty much perfectly. I look like just like any other 15 year old boy. Um, I don't really think about it anymore. It's just a part of me. So it, it's going great, I guess. They always made like the issues in my life to be about my, my gender first. And the real issues that I was experiencing were just, they never really addressed it very well. Yeah. And did, were you always heading for the mastectomy or did the binding bring it on or? Um, I mean, I wasn't thinking about it a whole lot during the very beginning. It was like, let's take it a step at a time. But that was just the, the natural pipeline. Like you start with socially transitioning, changing your name and the way that you dress. And then you start on whatever medication um, is necessary. And then any surgeries that you want. Yeah. And... I'd been using a binder for about two years by that point in time. Um, it was just like really uncomfy, tank top looking compression device. 
And when you live in a hot area and you walk like to and from school in this thing in, in hot weather and you work out in it, um, you swim in it, it just gets kind of nasty. Yeah. It's not fun. It's very uncomfy. And I wanted to be free of it. I didn't, I didn't like how it like poked out of my shirt collar and people would ask me like, hey, what's that under your, on your shirt? Like when I would like take my, my shirt off with the binder exposed. Some, there was one time when I did that while, while swimming at school and somebody told me that I looked very feminine and it was like, nope, yeah, I don't want to wear this thing anymore. I want to be able to take my shirt off like any other boy. And I started seeking surgery about halfway through my sophomore year of high school. And it was pretty much an immediate referral from the therapist to the gender specialist. And it was like, well, you've been on hormones for this amount of time and you've been transitioning socially for, for this long, so you're good to go. Just paying no mind to any of the the issues with my mental health at the time. And before I underwent the surgery, I was, me and my parents were recommended to undergo like a, to go to this like top surgery classroom at the clinic. And when we went, um, it was like maybe like 15 or so other families who were attending with their kids who identified as trans. And when I, when I, when I sat down and looked around, one of the very first things that I noticed was that all of the kids around me looked like they were either much younger or they hadn't even started on testosterone yet. Like these kids maybe looked like around like 12 to 14. And it kind of bugged me a little bit because like, wow, like they're already looking, they're already thinking about surgery. But it also kind of helped to reinforce in my mind that like, yes, this is normal. I'm not the only one. And again, it's only, it was only about like half a year of consultations up until actually going under the knife. Just before my 16th birthday. I'm so sorry. I, I just, I'm so sorry. At first, I thought it was something good. Mm -hmm. When I woke up from the surgery, I actually made a joke about it to my friends and my mom. And... I was, I was looking forward to being fully healed and being able to like bear my chest to the sun. I had like this little fantasy yeah. about like taking yeah. my shirt off at the beach and just like running without, without my shirt on, being free of my breasts. Mm -hmm. um, well, that never happened. Um, I wasn't able to, I was told that this would be part of the process. I wouldn't be able to like lift my arms above my head till like two or three months afterward. Um, Cause like it's a major sur surgery in my upper body connects like all in an area with like all this, this muscle around it. And I had to have my mom home for a little bit to help take care of me around the house, like cook me food and stuff, um, help me clean. And that was kind of comfy, honestly. And then about like a week post-op, um, that was when I had my stitches taken out. And it was really just beyond uncomfortable, like looking down at that area of my body. Now it looked like a war zone, like with all like the surgical markings on it, the scars and the skin grafts. Uh, I'll spare the details about the, the skin grafts, but it was far from pretty. And the sensation, l looking down, seeing the stitches being taken out, but like barely being able to feel it and like this electric feeling in my chest, I almost threw up a few times during the procedure. It was, it was just so otherworldly, so unnatural. And when I went home, that was when like, I could finally be able to, that, that was when I had to start like doing my own dressings and like cleaning the wounds by, my, by myself um, at, like before and after like every, every shower. And it was just a lot of stress to have to look at that part of my body. And at this stage, were you kind of thinking the surgery is more difficult than I thought? Or were you thinking, I'm gone wrong? Or where were you going in your head? Like, I mean, everything that I was experiencing up until, until, up until this point was something that I was informed of. But it's not something that you can really even begin to digest until you're actually going through it yourself. It's no way of life for a 15-year-old. It's pretty brutal, honestly. Um, but I wasn't really questioning my transition 
up until that point in time. It was just like, well, it's tough and kind of disgusting, but it's just a part of the process. And I thought that way. I thought that the, the stress around my surgery was just a part of the healing process. But I never really got better. Over time, um, this was like in the, in the middle of uh, when quarantine was still a thing. And I was very isolated, pretty much always on the internet. And like seeing all these pretty girls post themselves in their bedrooms, it was like, wow, like, I don't know why, but I kind of wish I looked like them. Oh, Chloe. I was starting to miss like having my hair long, wearing makeup, dresses. Now that I looked pretty much like a, like a guy, and had a super deep voice and everything. I couldn't do any, any of that. If I went to school looking like that, I would get some pretty nasty reactions. And that was when it really started to hit. Like I'm losing quite a bit here, even like some little things. And I started to feel shame around my transition. It was like, well, it feels like the further I go into it, the more dissociated I feel for myself, especially for my body. And now like I can't express myself the way that I used to. I can't really make friends the way that I used to. And I miss all of this. I started like wearing like some of my old girl clothes and like sometimes like drugstore makeup, just like in the comfort of my room because I didn't want anybody to see me like that because it was humiliating. We'd like to jump in here really quick and offer up a thank you to Genspect, one of our sponsors. Genspect is an international organization that offers a healthy approach to sex and gender. Genspect recently hosted the Bigger Picture Conference in Denver, Colorado. There, they introduced the Gender Framework, a comprehensive, non-medical means of dealing with distress about gender issues. Go to genspect.org to learn more. We'd also like to give a shout out to Geta, Gender Exploratory Therapy Association. If you're looking for a therapist for yourself or your child, check out the GETA directory. And if you're a clinician who is questioning the affirmation model and you're looking for resources and community, please consider joining GETA today. Visit genderexploratory.com to learn more. How soon after <clears throat> your surgery did you start experimenting with girl clothes again? Um, probably about like the three to four month mark. So very soon after. That's so soon. And yeah, I, it was very hard for me to even admit to myself that it could have been wrong because I was so deep into it. Everybody knew me now as a boy named Leo. I was a son, I was a grandson, a nephew, a brother. How could I be anything else anymore? How could I ever go back? But the, 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 the further I went, the worse I got. And it wasn't until nearly about a year after the surgery, um, there was a class I took that really opened my eyes up. Um, it was a psychology class, and I didn't really expect to, uh, to have any sort of epiphany about myself. But at the end, it was, uh, it was very focused on like families and like, uh, like childhood psychological developments. Yeah, attachment, that was a big one. Like the, the Harlow rhesus monkey experiment was, I think that was ultimately what woke me up actually. Cause it was like, there's, there was like all the focus on like physical affection and breastfeeding and it's like attachment between, between mother and infant. And it was like, I lost my ability to breastfeed. And I didn't realize just how integral that is to a lot of women's relationships with their children. I thought that I would never want to breastfeed because men don't do that. But I was no man. I had a maternal instinct. I wanted to become a mother and I wanted to do so naturally. I wanted the experience of getting pregnant, giving birth and feeding my children the way that I was born to. But now all of that could be gone. And this realization was deeply painful for me. I was, I was 16 now, and adulthood was not too far away. But now I'm, I've lost parts of myself as a woman before I could even call myself that. 
I didn't know what to do with myself. I didn't know what I was anymore, but I knew I couldn't keep living like that. What else could I lose? I didn't know because I didn't know that I would lose all this. How did you eventually come to sharing that? Because you were privately having these thoughts. You were trying on clothes. You were thinking about breastfeeding. This all must have been so personal and, and, and hard to kind of carry that burden alone. You were still a kid. I mean, you're still very young. When did you decide to, when did you decide to say out loud some of these thoughts? Um, I mean, it took a few re weeks for me to really decide that I was going to detransition. Um, during that period of time, I was very dysfunctional. And I, I didn't know what to call myself. I couldn't bring myself to call myself a girl for the longest time. But I knew, like, I had to tell my friends. I had to tell my mom and dad. It was not supposed to happen. It was the deepest regret of my life. And that was shameful to admit because everybody was a part of it. And my mom and dad, I knew they were going to feel awful because they were the ones who signed off. They were going to feel so much guilt. And was it from the day you read about the rhesus monkey where the, the, the monkeys can't breastfeed or, and there's a kind of a cage and some, from that day onwards, was that like literally an epiphany of I've gone wrong? Oh. And then you kept it to yourself thinking, how do I get out of this cage? Yeah, I mean, there is that element of it being embarrassing, right? But also, like, it was hard for me to verbalize that. It was a lot of information for me to take in, especially about something so deeply personal. I mean, I'm, I'm noticing what an incredibly independent person you've always been, and I don't know if that's purely out of necessity or because you have that personality trait, but you went from having transitioned living as a boy to figuring this out. And then when you came to your parents, you knew it was the biggest regret of your life. It was not, hey, mom and dad, I'm having this scary thought. What do I do? I mean, you came determined already knowing what you had to do next. I mean, that's pretty remarkable. Is that just the, the Chloe way? I mean, is that just you? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I feel like it kind of is like a product of how I rate how I was raised, but it, I, I also wouldn't doubt that it's probably just a part of me as well. Okay. What did they say? Um, they weren't really sure what to say at first, but they weren't pushing back, of course. They were just, they were very shocked. I feel like my mom definitely saw it coming more easily than my dad with how stressed I was becoming over the course of my transition. But even though we didn't really talk about it personally very much during that first year, it was very painful for them. I really feel like they were just as hurt as I was because, you know, I was the one going through it, but they were the ones watching it most closely. I was their kid. And did you uh, say to them, it's all been a terrible mistake, or did you say, I want to detransition, or uh, how did you communicate it? I didn't know the word detransition yeah. yet. I just told them, I regret my transition. I don't know what to do with myself. I couldn't even like call my mom because I didn't want her to hear me crying. I just texted her. So oh. at, at what point did your family or you think we should consult with the doctors because they probably know what this turbulence is about? I mean, did you at some point go consult with the endocrinologist, the psychologist, et cetera? Oh yeah, I, I tried. Um, when I went back to my gender specialist and I saw her for maybe like half a year after that, she was very unhelpful, like remarkably so. It was common for her to say things like, well, it's just another part of your gender journey, isn't it? Isn't it just another transition? And I shot her down immediately because it was like, no, like this is my rejection of my transition. This is not another transition. I don't want to go through another transition. I want it to stop. I wanted to just grow. And do you remember somebody saying the word detransition to you, the concept? No, it honestly just, I kind of came up with it, I thought. I didn't even know if it was a word yet, but I remember at one point it was like, I wonder if this has happened before. 
maybe maybe there's a term for this. And I thought, well, maybe, you know, I, I went through a transition, right? Well, now I'm stopping, so maybe it's a detransition. What and year, I Googled what it. What year was that? 2021. Oh okay. my God, 2021. So, but you were really online before, so you had never come across... I mean, you weren't no. in those spaces anymore online or what? Um, so I actually talked about the trend to... I, I still had friends within the trans community at this point in time, quite a few actually, and people would like call themselves allies and stuff. When I talked about my detransition, I got a lot of crap for it, like from a lot of other transgender people mostly. Um, it was insane actually. The things they were telling me were just abusive. Like. I thought of these people as like a second family to me. It was a community that I wanted to uphold and that it was filled with people that I loved. And now they're telling me like, this is all your fault. You should have known exactly what you were doing to yourself. You weren't stupid, you know? You, the doctors told you what was gonna happen. So you should have known better. Oh. You gotta, why, why are you talking about this to me? You're just making me uncomfortable. Like you're, you're hurting the community by talking about this. Did, did those responses cause you to question your determination to stop? No, not my, I, I knew that I couldn't keep transitioning, but it's, it made me stop talking about it for a while. Cause it was like, oh, like it's these people that I love telling me that I'm hurting them. I can't keep doing that. And also like I was a 16 year old girl, like as, as much bullying as I had been through in, in elementary, middle school, like it had never gotten that bad. People weren't like telling me this awful stuff about something so deeply personal to me before. Like it was, it was awful. Like I IRL or online? Or it, was, it was pretty much all online. Yeah. But like sometimes like I would get into spats with my friends in real life um, telling me like, oh, like sorry that you had that experience, but like I think that anybody should be allowed to transition. Or I think like I, I had like a fairly like left-leaning friend group and so, like, they were they were pretty attached to to stuff like this. So I think, like, I I, I lost a lot, of my, a lot of my friends from school my senior year. I think, like, partly because like I was just like so unstable at the time from stopping the the hormones, cold turkey, and uh, and the trauma of what I had been through. But also because of like the ideological disputes, like they just did not want to deal with that. And you stopped the testosterone to cold turkey? Yeah, I didn't get any guidance on how to stop. So it was like, as soon as I told the, endocrino the endocrinologist, like, hey, I'm stopping, she was like, okay. Oh, my God. <laughs> did they just send you on your way, or did they have you come in every three months for a fall? Like, what? No, I was trying to push for that. I was trying to push for, like, regular blood tests, but I had to, like, schedule them individually, and after a while, I was like, these people are not going to help me. Wow. So you Googled the <laughs> transition... And then what? Did, did you go, oh my God, I'm not the only person? Yeah, that was when I discovered like the, the subreddit and some of the Discord servers um, like dedicated to this. And it took a while for me to get verified um, in the one that I mainly use because like I actually looked so masculine at the time. I looked like a 16 year old boy with long hair. Wow. Um, but eventually like I started to interact pretty, pretty closely with these people and was like, wow, I'm not alone. And these are like hundreds or even like thousands of people that I'm, that I'm talking with on a daily basis. And it's like everything that I knew that we knew from the trans community, from our own doctors was a lie. Oh my God. I certainly was not the only one. And well, all, the, all these people who I, was, who I was talking to were, well, the kids were all desisted. None of them actually went on hormones. And mostly people who did were adults who went on it as an adults. But I, I just had this feeling itching at me that there had to be so many kids like they're out me, like, so many kids like they're out there, out there like me. And I just, I, I felt over time that I wanted to start speaking up about my own story because even though I didn't know any, anybody like that at the time, who was so young, it was kind of like an, an intuition I had. And I felt like I had a responsibility to start speaking about this. And did you know anybody, we would call them famous detransitioners, if you follow me, the ones that we know, did you know any of them before you started speaking out? I remember when you started speaking out. No, I don't, I don't think so. I think like maybe other than Richie and maybe Kat Kattinson, I don't think I was really 
I really knew of any, any famous cases like that at the time. So how long between discovering detransition and starting to speak out took place? Because it, it seems like this has all happened really fast. Yeah, I mean, it was maybe like a, like a year or so in. Um, it took a few months for me to start calling myself a girl again because it was just very uncomfortable to come back to that after years of thinking like I was the very opposite. And at first I was like, well, you can refer to me by any pronouns and just by my chosen name. And I started, I started thinking about my, my name, what I would want to be called from now on because I like the name Leo. I think it's pretty cool. And it, it was based off my birth name too, just like a few letters switched around. But one day I thought, you know, my, my, my birth name was a gift from my mom and dad, you know? If I don't let them have that, isn't that kind of cruel of me? And I decided that I would, as uncomfortable as it was, um, I just had to go back. I felt like I put them through a lot of pain, so I'd owe them that at least, you know? Um, and socially, I struggled quite a bit. I didn't have any friends my senior year, so I, I dropped out about halfway through and just took my diploma equivalent. Um, and I tried to make some friends outside of school, which was quite uh, a process of trial and error because there was, some, there, there, there was a lot of weird people that I met, but I also had like, a lot of productive discussions around stuff like this with people whose values really started to align with mine. I learned that it was more important that I learned to make friends with people who I can have like proper discussions with and bond with over like our, our shared values and beliefs rather than like who just makes me comfortable or who, or who, who I have fun with. And I started posting again about my detransition, um, questioning the dogma a little bit around transition in general. Um, I got a lot of crap for that, but with the initial response that I got from just talking about my detransition, like I knew what I was gonna get into. And one day I decided, well, I might as well use a platform like Twitter because that's like very, it's very discussion oriented, right? It'll be a lot more easy than like just like using Discord or Reddit or, uh, or Instagram to talk about things like this. And um, I made my account, I think in like early like winter last year. And I wasn't really expecting anything to come out of it. Um, but soon like there were reporters talking to me on the phone. Um, there were like dozens of parents like in my mentions and in my DMs like asking for help with, with their own families. And then eventually I had like a parent group reach out to me asking me if I was willing to testify on a bill. And <laughs> I, I, went, I literally went from like, just like dropping out of school because I had like no friends and like being the shy kid in school to uh, talking on legislation for the first time. And it was, it was quite the jump. And now that's like, that's a big part of what I've been, what I've been focusing on for the past year. And can I ask you? We're, we're coming up to the end, and thank you for being so generous with everything you've, you've told us. I, I, I wonder, when was it hardest, and when did it start getting easier? The hardest in terms of what? The whole, the whole run of it. Like, was it hardest, you know, that year where you, you were deep in the transition, or was it after the mastectomy? Or? I think that very first year after detransitioning was probably the lowest point in my life with all, like, the the hormones being screwed with and my body trying to regulate itself and like losing all my friends, losing my support online even to try and like basically like pick up the pieces of my life back together and like kind of like processing the trauma of what I'd been through. But I find that it just gets better. Sometimes I have regressions, sometimes it hurts, but I mean, it's, it's so worth it. Like I'm so much healthier than I was then and now, like, I, I have something to live for, to work for. Like, I, I've been a big part of this movement around protecting children. And I was hoping that in speaking out, like, I could 
influence other people who have been through the same thing to start speaking out if they so wanted to. And now there's been like an influx of thousands of detransitioners just within like the past two years coming up online. There, I, like sometimes I'll just like scroll through Twitter and Insta or Instagram, right? And I'll just randomly find like a detransitioner anonymously following me or a new account talking about their story. And now there's dozens of us who have come out to speak on legislation. And since then, I mean, just within the last two years, there's almost half of the states in the US have passed legislation on this to help protect kids and prevent what happened to us from ever happening ever again. Um, I'm aware, Chloe, that even your body language, the way you're talking, you've just energized because there's some really important purpose that you're contributing to in a huge way. And I want to say that this is a gift, and I'm sure it takes a lot out of you. And we all know, Chloe Cole, the story that you've been through that you shared here today, but I'd like to know if you imagine yourself far into the future. Let's say you're not talking about gender, you have nothing to do with gender. What are some other passions and things that you love? Because I know this is not talking in front of, you know, people is great. You're part of something amazing, but I know there's a lot more to you. So tell us a bit more about Chloe. Um, well, I mean, in the future, you know, like I'll, I'll be, I'll be in this fight for as long as I feel like I have to, however long it takes. Um, but once this is all said and done, you know, I've always kind of been like the creative type. I've been illustrating since I was young and ever since I started um, transitioning, I've had like a big creative block, but I'm struggling to get back into it. And I've gotten really into, into fashion in the past few years. It's really helped me to kind of rediscover myself and my identity since, since transitioning. Um, and I might want to start a brand of my own um, oh, I'm also <laughs> lovely. There's a you have a lovely style. When you <laughs> Thank came you. in yesterday, she just so you know, she bounded into the hotel and was like, da da. <laughs> it was lovely. Like you do have a lovely quirky style about you, so I can see how you'd Thank start you. a brand. And of course, I I want to have a family of my own. Um, I don't know how many kids I want to have yet. Um, and I don't think now is really the time for me to be focusing on things like romantic relationships, but. Uh, when the time comes. I also, like in the past, especially the past two years, I felt like, I felt more and more passionate about issues surrounding like, uh, like women and families and children in general. So I might continue doing work in, in those fields. Um, I don't know, I don't know what yet, but I mean now, like there, there's, there's just so many opportunities. It's so, it's so hard to know what'll happen next. The world is your oyster. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's overwhelming, though. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, yeah, Chloe. Yeah, we really appreciate it. Thank you, Chloe. <laughs> Thank you all for coming here today. And thank you guys for interviewing me. Thank you. Thanks for joining us this week on Gender, A Wider Lens. Listener support means a lot to us. If you enjoy the show, please like and subscribe on iTunes and leave a review. For more information, visit widerlenspod.com. There you'll learn about joining our listener community, how to contribute to our show, and where to find us on social media. Our discussions are for educational purposes and are not intended as a substitute for mental health services.